we hear a lot in the news these days about um, religious fundamentalism and the negativity that surrounds that that terminology has uh, has shifted there was a time when when people that we might would call you know, moderate or liberal in in their thinking uh, would would talk about those Christian fundamentalists but the conversation has shifted and it's about the the, the Muslim extremists those those radical fundamentalists that are of the the Islamic faith um, those guys are, are bad news they they take they take their their religious writing so serious that that they're going to carry it out if in their version or in their religious holy book it says to to kill the infidel okay find me an infidel and I'll go kill him that that's their that that's their modus operandi that's what they're about they're about living to the letter of the law of their religion and that's become a significant problem for the world hasn't it you know people all over the world now live in in fear of the the terrorists terrorism and unfortunately you know we have folks in in leadership in our country that that even refuse to call it what it is it is a a religious act because it's done in the name of a god little g and it's done in the name of an, a, a particular faith, the Islamic faith. So why not call it what it is? It's Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. I'm not afraid to call it that. I mean, what's the problem? We're just have we become so politically correct that we can't call things what they are? Well, not here, not in this pulpit. But my fear is that in pulpits all across America and around the world and, and in places of political influence, there's, there's no backbone to call things what they are anymore. You can't call sin, sin, because you might offend somebody. Well, we've discovered in our study of Galatians that, that Paul's not real afraid of offending somebody, is he? You talk about telling it like it is. I mean, he's called these, these people bewitched. He's, he's called them under the influence of, 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 of false teachers, and he's called them to, on the carpet over some issues that, that in reality mimic a kind of religious fundamentalism that is not Christianity. Now, they wanted to call it Christian, but as we've discovered, what's the big problem here? The Judaizers that, that are, have, have slithered into the church and begun to have an influencing voice in the churches in Galatia were telling folks that, that yeah, Jesus is, is, is good, and okay, he died on the cross for sins, and we get all that, but you still got to follow the law. You still got to have circumcision you still got to enter the Jewish faith because that's the one true religion and, and Paul is arguing no it, it, it's all about Christ it, it's not about the law we are free and that's the, the the whole issue that we're we're based all this on is is finding freedom in Jesus Christ it's the, it, when Jesus died and, and he rose again on that first Sunday, I, I, I love this time of year because we're gearing up toward Easter. The greatest, the single greatest holiday, holy day of the calendar year. We get a whole lot more celebrations, 
surrounding Christmas and, and, and all these other things, but, but the day my Jesus rose from the dead, that's the day that, that I, I get excited about. Not about giving a, a gift or a present. It's, it's about getting on my face before my Savior who gave himself for me. So that's what Paul is trying to, to reel the believers in, in Galatia back into. And so we're picking up today where we left off last time. And, and we're going to be in chapter 4 beginning in verse 8. And we're going to read down through oh, about verse 20. And we'll, we'll look at these verses together. The Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Galatia how, how then when you... When you knew not God, you did service unto them which were, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, what, how turned you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to, to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm going to use the word for here because that's the word in, in the, the, uh, the original language that is in, you here is in the, the genitive case in the, in the Greek, and I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but the translation should be for and not of. Paul's not afraid of the Galatians. He wasn't, a, oh, I'm afraid of you. That is not at all what the, the original text is saying. Paul is saying, I am afraid for you. And so the, the translator should have inserted the, the right preposition here. It should say, I am afraid for you, not of you. Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. You've not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at, at the first. And my temptation, uh, maybe we need to, to kind of work on that word a little bit again. The word temptation here in, in our King James is, it, it's more of the idea of a trial. God, God, it, it, my presence in front of you was kind of like a trial to you because I repulsed you and we're going to find out why. Uh, so we might say that my, my coming before you as a, as a test or a trial in my flesh, you despise not, nor rejected, but you received me as, a, as an angel or a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the, the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear your record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And for that reason, we believe that the infirmity that Paul is speaking about back in, uh, in verse, thir uh, verse 14, that, that, that testing or that trial that, that could have caused them to, to reject him was a physical infirmity that, it, that had to do with his eyes. Some... Some scholars believe it, it might possibly have been a case of malaria that Paul had, had been infected with and, and it affected his physical appearance. So malaria can do that. It can swell the body up. And so he, he likely came into Galatia to get some medical help for an illness that he had contracted along the way. Or it may have been part of what Paul told the Corinthians uh, about this this um, test or this this thorn in the flesh that God had given him to uh, to to humble him to to keep him humble before before God it, it may have been that and it affected his eyesight we're not sure all we know is that that for some reason when Paul first came to this Galatian region. He had some type of physical issue that, that could have repulsed them. But rather than being repulsed by him, they, they welcomed him in and they welcomed the message of Jesus. Verse 16, he says, Am I therefore become your enemy? 
because I tell you the truth, they, that is those Judaizers, these false teachers that have crept into the body, they uh, zealously affect you. Zealously affect is one word in the original language. In the Greek, it's just one word translated here by two words, zealously affect. It could be translated to, to zealously seek after, to, to, to kind of take and devour for themselves. That's the idea behind uh, the, the Greek here, the original. And so Paul says they, they zealously affect you or, or seek you out but not well. It's not for the good. Yea, they would exclude you. That word means to alienate. They would alienate you. They would cut you off that you might the same word here affect them is that same word zealous all, used all over again that you would be zealous toward them rather than toward the Lord. Verse 18, but it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing. Not only when I'm present with you, my little children, oh, uh, of whom I, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice where I stand in, in doubt of you word to stand in doubt is could be translated per perplexed you concern me I'm I'm perplexed by what you're doing here is what Paul is saying to the Galatians well, let's pause here and we're gonna go back and we're gonna unpack some of this but let me pray first fathers we bow before you again we want to come before you as, as children who cry out, Abba, Father, our Daddy in heaven. We need your touch today. We, we need to hear your voice. We need the power and presence of your Spirit in our lives to strengthen us because we're weak and we're frail and, and we're prone to wander. But you, God, make us strong. You make us so that we can rise up, we can mount up with wings like, like the eagles. We can run and not grow weary. We can walk and, and not faint. You strengthen us, God. And we need your strength today. Help us to understand these great truths from your word. And we can apply the principles here to our lives and, and be better servants in your kingdom. Be more affectionate and intimate in our, in our walk with you. And be a, a positive influence because of your great love to this lost world that we're still in that you've left us in to be salt and light. Illumine our minds and our hearts today to receive these, these truths in, into our lives, to ingest the, the bread of, of your word until it becomes a part of us. And we thank you for the great freedom we have in Christ no longer slaves to the law but free to obey you because we love you not out of pure fear although we do fear a holy God but we obey you because we love you and we want to please you in Jesus name Amen Do you feel free today? You feel, is it just, is it a feeling? 
or is it something you are? You either are free or you're not. It really doesn't have anything to do with feeling. But oftentimes we base things in our lives on how we feel. How do you feel about this? Well, I don't know. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't know where you want to go to eat. I don't know where you want to go to eat. You ever had that conversation? It drives me crazy. It, th this is not based on our feeling, but, but it, 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 the fact should affect our, feel, our feelings. Does that make sense? And, and here's some facts that we want to, to uh, glean from God's Word today. These great truths from the Apostle Paul to the, the believers there in Galatia. Let's just dive in, and, and this will just be in your outline, simple and straightforward, a, a few statements of, of what I believe to be the, some truths from God's Word that Paul is trying to help the believers in Galatia get back to it and understand and, and, and incorporate into their lives so they can live for Christ. The, the first thing is this, religious fanaticism neither saves you nor sustains you. Religious fanaticism neither saves you nor sustains you. Paul is, Paul is bringing up their past. How do you like it when people bring up your past? They, um, let's don't go there, okay? But Paul needs them to understand where they came from and where they're going if they don't change direction to kind of come back to, to the truth of the gospel. Because where they came from is this. For the most part, those folks in Galatia were, were Gentiles, so there were Jews that were saved. And, and Paul would always go to the synagogue first, right? When he would enter on his missionary journeys, he would go to the local church, the synagogue, where the Jews met to worship. And he would preach Christ to them right out of, right out of Scripture, out of the Old Testament. And so many would come to Christ, but others would refuse. And, and those that came to Christ, they would start a new church, likely in someone's home. So you had the house churches that Paul talks about, uh, in, or Luke talks about in, in Ephesus. There in the book of Acts, he talks about the house churches that Paul went to house to house. And so what they had came, come out of in their Gentile background was, was pagan religion. This past Wednesday night with the children, uh, in our, on our Team Kid, we, we do a mission study every week, and, and oftentimes there's a, a video that we'll, we'll watch that, um, that they put together that kind of talks about a particular part of the world or an area of the world where a missionary is doing some work. And this last week, we, we discovered a, a part of, of Russia, um, and, in, and in this part of Russia, there, there's a group of people there that have this wonderful history about them great traditions and every year they have these festivals, these feasts and everything And but the name of these people is derived from a word in their language that means the people of the woods the people of the woods and the reason they got that name was because they believed that there were spirits out in the, the, the forest that surrounded their village. The, there, were, there were gods that lived among the trees and, and, and they, would, they would take things, they would, they would offer sacrifices, they would worship these gods of the trees and so they became known as the people of the wood. Now later on, communism came in. And communism forget, for, forbid them to believe in anything. It says there just is no God. So they went from a, a, a polytheistic extreme all the way over to the extreme that says there is no God. And we all know that the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But now folks have come in the name of Jesus and introduced them to the one true God who gave himself.
Jesus gave himself for our, our sins as a, the Lamb of God. So all of that religious fanaticism that, that they may have had before in, in their old life, did you pick up on what they're doing? Paul says you... There was a time, verse 8, when, when you served those things which are by nature nothings. They're not gods, but you serve them as if they were. They're no gods. They're statues. They're wood. They're stone. They're, they're metals. But now, he says, after you, you, you came to know God through Christ... And I love this phrase in here. He says, or rather known of God. Or known by God. Because Paul is making a statement and then he's saying, but there's a greater theological truth and I've got to throw this in there too. That we don't just come to know God on our own terms. We don't just find God somewhere along the way. God was always pursuing us. We are found of Him before we ever find him for ourselves. And now that they had done that, they're, they're turning again back to a system that had them in bondage before they came to Christ in the first place. When in verse 10 he talks about those days and months and times and years, he's talking about the ritualistic system of that Jewish faith that the Judaizers were saying, all right, not only you need circumcision, you've got to do this, and, and on this day, and on that day, and this feast, and that festival, and you've got to obey the, the, the law in order to be right with God. And that's why in verse 11, Paul says, I'm, I'm afraid for you. I, I fear for your well-being. You know, isn't this always Satan's plan of attack? He did it in the garden. This is exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. The, the temptation was never really about the forbidden fruit. Do you get that? The temptation was never really about the, the forbidden fruit. It was... It was always the temptation to believe that God was holding out on them. That there was something more. And that biting into that fruit would somehow solve that problem. And they would be godlike. You remember that's what Satan told Eve. Oh, you'll be like God. He just doesn't want you to know. When in reality, they only became Satan-like, cast out, alienated from God. And that's exactly what is the legalism does in many believers' lives. Something other than, than God has become the object of their affection. It, it's, let me tell you this. It's the religious system that's become God and not God himself. Do you get that? I think sometimes what we really believe is, is in our religious system that we call our faith rather than the fact that we really believe we're free in Christ. That he set us free. And we only do this stuff out of love for him and not, a, not out of an obligation to please him, but out, of a, uh, but out of a love, loving relationship that desires to please him. You see, in verse 11, when Paul says, I, I'm afraid for you, I, I fear for you. This is point number two in your outline. Just, you want to get this down. What, what was initially built on the gospel of Jesus Christ it is often torn down in the name of religion and replaced with a gospel of self-righteousness. If I can just be righteous enough, then, 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 then I'll be in God's good graces. 
And, and you know, if I, if I don't, then, then I won't. So I, I want to be in God's good graces, so I'm just, I'm just going to work for that. And Paul says, you can't do it. Because you're either in a loving relationship with God or you're not. And God already loves you. Jesus already died for those sins. So why do you keep working for something that's already been purchased for you? That you could never do enough to earn for yourselves. So Paul says, I I'm afraid for you because all this, this effort that I've poured into you, my, my labor over you, it's going to be in vain. I hinted at this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the fact that, that, that the church is always one generation away from, from closing the doors, from, from going out of business. Because if we don't reach the next generation with the truth of the gospel, then all we're doing is, is creating social clubs and a place to come, out, come and hang out and and, and be together and, and, and have a good warm fellowship and, and leave and go do your life and then come again and do it the next week. And, and God's not ever involved in that. And there's no salvation in that because there's no repentance of sin. There's no getting our hearts right before God so He can make us the vessels that He created us to, us to be to, in service in His kingdom. See, Paul knew that if they continued down this road, that all was in vain. There's no hope for the next generation if, if they believe that salvation involves something more than Christ. So in verses 12 and following, we could kind of sum that up this way at the end of the day the greatest attribute of a believer is, is still love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Paul writes about love after he writes that great love chapter as we've called it he comes to the end and he says now, now there's three things there's three really important things and there's faith there's hope and there's love but the greatest of these is love it's exactly like Norm said at the beginning of our, our worship time this morning if all people ever think about us as Christians our individual lives that we're somehow judgmental to them that we're just finger pointing at all the things in their lives now don't get me wrong that that's what Paul is doing Paul's saying listen there's some things in your life that we need to, to kind of get right and get back on track so there's, there's nothing wrong with that but, but if the attitude of the world at large is that those Christians they're just haters and so um, they're, they're not going to accept me they're, in fact you know they've already condemned me so why should I ever even want to go down there and the only way, and that's the perception. That's the reality of the world we live in, of the America we live in anyway. Now, there are some pockets in the world where Christianity is just absolutely on fire. God is, is, is doing incredible things in, in China. Under communism, the underground church is, is flourishing because they, they, they got it. They understand that they're free in Christ. And it's a communistic system, so what? I'm free in Christ. In, in Africa, there are pockets in Africa where, where the Islamic extremists are, are, are killing people, but there's pockets in Africa where the gospel of Jesus Christ is absolutely on fire. And I long for the day when, when we get on fire again for the gospel. When we get fired up again, and I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to talk about that, that zeal, that passion, because Paul brings it up. You may have heard the phrase, your love makes the heart grow fonder. 
I, I don't know that that's always the case. Now, I know when I go on a trip and, and I'm away from my family, you know, I really want to get back home and I want to, you know, be with them and love on them and, 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 and just be family and, and, and have that love. But Paul had been away from these folks for a long time. Some months and, and in all likelihood some years have gone by. I mean, it, he didn't have a jet plane to hop in and go, you know, fly in and, and make a personal appearance and, you know, preach an evangelistic crusade and then head back to, you know, Caesarea or Antioch or wherever else he, he may have been. So he had been away from them. And, and it, 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 he's talking about the, the love relationship they had when he came that, that even as, as sick as he was and as repulsive as the, apparently the disease he, he had made him physically look, they loved on him. They welcomed him in because he came bearing the good news of Jesus. And they fell in love with that. And he was the messenger that brought that good news. So they loved Paul. And now he's fearful that that, that, that love has grown cold, not just for him, but, but for Christ. I know the time away from Jesus doesn't make the heart grow warmer. It makes it grow colder. Colder toward, toward obedience and, and submission to His will in our lives. Colder toward that, that sweet fellowship that we have when, when we're, we're, we're with Him and we're in His Word and we're fellowshipping with Him in prayer and, and in, the, in His Spirit. We, we grow cold in, a, in a, our desire to, to serve Him and to serve His bride, the church. We grow cold in our attitude, in our action, our effort in His kingdom work when we're not with Him on a regular basis. It doesn't take long to, to just get cold. Cold is a feeling, isn't it? Now, we can measure coldness, but how do you measure the temperature of a believer's heart. In fact, Jesus has said at one point, Revelation 3, I'd, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. Because when you're lukewarm, that makes me sick at my stomach and I just as soon spew you out. See, God is, is looking for zeal. In your outline, number four, verses 17 and 18, God, is, God desires zeal in our, in our hearts, we, but, but we have to be zealous for the right thing. See, Paul said that these enemies of Christ, that's who they are, have come in and, and preached a, a different gospel or a, a gospel of Jesus plus something else, and and they're sucking you in and you're becoming zealous for something that, that's not good. Paul, Paul says this, it, it's not well. It's not a good thing, verse 17. And what happens in this case is that you get excluded. You get excluded from a right relationship with, with God because you're teaching something besides the, the truth of the gospel. And the only reason they want you to do that is because they, they, want, to, they want you to be zealous for them. They like applause. They like the spotlight. They love it when you give them attention. But don't quit don't just say, okay, I just won't be zealous for anything. Verse 18, Paul says, be zealous for the right thing. What does that word zealous mean? It's be passionate about something. When you have zeal, you, you've got a drive, you, you've got life. You can be a a 
couch potato Christian or you can be a front line army of the Lord Christian you get to choose that you're free and when Christ came to make you free he, he made you free to, to even choose whether you're going to really serve him or not that doesn't please him if you don't and if you just sit on the sideline and never do anything for Christ and, and, and really show his love and, and care for those around you and, and, and take that cup of cold water in, the na in Jesus' name and, and visit and, and help and, and do all those things. He wants you to have a, a zeal for Christian ministry. But do it for the right reason not out of an obligation to score points with, with God, but out of a, a love that's in reaction to his love for you. Let me give you this last thing real quickly. Number five in your outline, genuine pastoral care is like the birth pangs of a mother. Never thought about that, did you? Did you see that's what Paul said in verse 19? My little children of whom I travail in birth again? This is Paul's pastoral heart for the people he led to Christ. They're his children in the faith. Now, now granted, the, the church has grown and, 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 and was doing what it should in terms of witnessing and other believers were coming into the body that may not have ever known Paul, but those that first came to faith in Christ in Galatia were in all likelihood the result of, of that mission work of, of Paul sharing the gospel of Jesus. They came to Christ. They got saved. And, and Paul, in, 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 at, by the work of God in him is like birthing them into the kingdom of, of God. And now he's saying, listen, I, I'm suffering here. I, I'm like, a, I'm like a, a, a woman who's ready to, you know, give birth to this thing. Some of you ladies have been there. I've had a kidney stone or two. They tell me it's like the pain of childbirth, but I, I can't vouch for that. But I'll tell you this. That was Paul's heart. Paul cared so deeply for the believers in Galatia. He didn't want that, that work that he had labored over them to be in vain. He, he just wanted them to, to be in love with Jesus and to serve him and, and him only. The law is not, a, is not a good God. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness. Only the pointed finger. You know you did it. You know you did it. You know you did it. That's what the law... And we've already talked about that, so we won't bring all that back up again. But that's, that's the reality of, of living in legalism. When, when Christ set us free from that, and, and Paul's saying, you're... I want this for you so badly. It, I hurt like a woman trying to give birth here. You, I want you to grow up. I want you to be, be mature in Christ. I, I want to change my voice. I know I'm coming across as kind of harsh, Paul said, but I, I don't want to be that. But sometimes, you know, as a parent, you kind of have to lay down the law so to speak even though Paul is saying I'm not, this isn't about the law I, I, he's, he's laying down the principles that will help them to live in the freedom that Christ brought just like that, that new, new mother give, giving birth the pain is, is worth it when a precious life enters the world and in, in Paul's case He's willing to suffer in an effort to, to make certain a mature believers being birthed and spiritually nur nurtured. Um, it, it's, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying it's a process. Let, let's do this together. Um, 
You hear me say this from time to time. Let's just say it together. The truth is, I'm not all I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I was. Can y'all say that with me? I'm not all I want to be. Can we say that together? I'm not all I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I was. That's what Jesus does. The law can't do that. Legalism can't do that. It'll just keep pointing his finger in your face saying, you messed up again. You're sorry. You're no good. You did it again and you know you did it. And you have to say, yep, you're right. I know I did it. But thanks be to God. Who's delivered us from that accusation from that body of death, as Paul calls it in Romans, have been delivered, set free. Is there a chance that today you've, you've come here and you've realized it? All this talk about freedom, I, I'm not even sure. I, I'm not sure I've got any of that. I don't know that I've ever come to a place where I can say I'm, I'm free in Christ because I, I have a personal relationship with him do you know what that means do you know that it means that, that I admit because the law tells me I'm a sinner and I admit that but there's nothing that, that the law can do for that only Jesus could die for that sin in my life and so I say Lord Jesus I know what I am I'm a sinner and I repent of that I turn to you I need you to be the Savior of my life. Will you forgive my sin? Will you come into my heart? Will you save me and set me free from all of that? And when you pray a prayer like that, in the humility of your heart, and you really mean that, there's not one time ever God has said no to that prayer. That's the prayer of salvation confessing who he is and that you're a sinner and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead so that your sin could be forgiven because he paid the price. That's the gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. That, that's it. Again, the rest of it is learning how to live in the freedom that we've been given. Will you bow your head with me? just a moment we're going to have a, a hymn of invitation and if today you need to, to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life if you realize you've never really been set free because you've never really let go and, and let God be the Savior and Lord of, of your life you've never come to that place where you said Jesus I, I need you and I need your forgiveness of my sin and I I want to live for you. Help me and forgive me and come into my life and set me free. Would you, just our heads bowed and our eyes closed, would, would you say, Pastor, that's me. I, I, I don't know that I've ever done that before. I, I want to do that. I'm just not sure I've, I've ever done that. Would just with, with heads bowed and, and eyes closed, just between you and me and God, would you lift your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I, I just, I'm not sure that I have that freedom in my heart. Okay, thank you. You put your hands down. Would you pray that? Would, would, would you really be honest with God for the very first time to say, Jesus set me free. I can't live in this bondage anymore and you didn't intend for me to. I, I do repent of my sin. I know what I am. And I know that I need a Savior. I need you, Jesus. Would you say right now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me. And cleanse me. Make me right with you. Just as the Bible says that, that you can you can cleanse all sin you can forgive all sin and I pray that you 
make me clean and, and right with you so that I can live for you and, and love you and be free in you the way you made me to be. Now, if you've prayed that prayer today, if you've prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, would you lift your hand just again between you and me and God? Would you say that I've, I've now prayed that prayer. I, I've trusted Jesus. Okay, thank you. you. Put your hands down. And I invite you to, to make that public decision to say that that's what's happened in my heart and I, I don't care what it means. I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus and, and I'm free in Him and it doesn't matter who knows or doesn't know. I want the world to know. That's why we have invitations to invite to, to come and express to the world what, what you have done in your heart to ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior. So I invite you to come Others who may need to come and, and pray and get some things right with God, I invite you to come. Father, we've, we've looked at the truths of your word today, and I pray now that we would be obedient in faith. Amen.